Welcome to the Covered Bridges of New Hampshire podcast, where we discuss all things related to covered bridges in the Granite State. Here's your host, Kim Chandler. Hello, Covered Bridge people, and welcome to the podcast. This episode is all about the town truss. This lattice truss design was first patented by Ithiel Town in 1820 and has since been regarded as one of the most significant developments in the history of covered bridges. Engineer Sean James will explain why that is and tell us about some of New Hampshire's town truss bridges. You'll learn a lot in this episode. Here we go. In this episode, we'll learn about the town truss. Patented by Ithiel Town in 1820 and again in 1835, the town truss is a common truss design in New Hampshire covered bridges. In fact, New Hampshire is home to 18 town truss bridges and three of our railroad bridges employ a double town truss design. To visualize a town truss, think of the Ashwilot Bridge in Winchester or the Squam River Bridge in Ashland. If you're not familiar with those bridges, picture garden lattice a series of crisscross timbers. To help us understand the town trust, we're talking today with engineer Sean James, Senior Vice President of Hoyle Tanner & Associates in Manchester. Sean has over 26 years of structural engineering experience, including over 40 covered bridge projects, including inspection, construction administration, and management of projects throughout New England and New York. Sean earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering and a Master of Science in Structural Engineering from the University of Maine and an MBA from Southern New Hampshire University. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Thanks. Great to be here. Can you start out the podcast by telling us how you became so involved with Covered Bridges? Sure. Uh, That goes back to, uh, you mentioned University of Maine. So in between my uh, bachelor's and master's degree, we had an opportunity. We were approached, my advisor was approached by the Coal Land Transportation Museum in Bangor to uh, to build a covered bridge. So that, that really got me started. So for that one, I got to design the, the superstructure of the bridge and actually see it built. Um, so, so that was kind of the beginning of it. And then I think that experience partially helped me get the job at Hoyle Tanner where I started. And within the first year there, we had two covered bridge projects that we were we were working on and then just been continuing from there. Great. And that's pretty much what you do now is covered bridges, or do you do other things as well? We, we do a lot of different things. So uh, currently my role is uh, I manage our ground transportation group. Okay. So that involves highway bridge engineers in about four different states uh, working on a lot of different projects, but the... The nice part of being in charge of the group is I get to pick my projects as well. So I am working right now on the Whittier Covered Bridge in Ossipee, uh, which actually we're going to relocate over the uh, over the river tomorrow. It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. So exciting. That's so. Yeah, we keeping it a little quiet. The contractor doesn't like big crowds there, but uh, uh, they moved it a little bit today. Went pretty smoothly. So we'll move it the rest of the way tomorrow. Oh, that's so exciting. Thank you for sharing that with me. I won't tell anyone. Well, this won't come out until later. So it'll be it'll be across <laughs> the river by then. That's great. right. That's great. So I I described a, a town truss when we started, but if you wanted to add anything to that, and I also wanted to talk about trunnels. Can you can you talk about trunnels a little bit? Yeah, trunnels is kind of like a. I think where it started, at least what I've read. Um, you, you're never quite sure on some of these things, but they were uh, tree nails, they called them. Mm-hmm. And typically it's an inch and three quarter to two inch diameter. Uh, it's, it's like a long peg, generally made out of white oak. And um, there's a little bit of, you know, interest, interesting how they, they work in that uh, it's a friction fit. So we make the trunnel and then put some wax or an oil on it and then drive it into the hole that's just a little bit smaller than the trunnel to give you a friction fit. And and how many trunnels might a town lattice truss bridge have, just a rough estimate? Well, I would probably, depending on the length, you know, you could have over a couple hundred. Wow. There's typically, yeah, it's typically in where the lattice meets the cord at every intersection. So you, you mentioned that lattice where pieces cross. So where the lattice crosses the cord, you'd have three or four at every one of those. And then where the lattice cross, you'd have a couple there. Mm-hmm. 
So they, they add up pretty quickly. Yeah. It seems like a very painstaking process too, to take them out and put them back. It, it can be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine. So Towns' 1820 patent is considered one of the most significant developments in the history of covered bridges. Why is that? I think what's really unique about a town, Lattice, if you think some of the other trust types, you know, if, if people are familiar with them, a lot of them had pretty intricate joinery. Uh, they, they really required a, a skilled craftsman to do really tight joints, sometimes some fancy, like these lightning bolt joints and a lower cord uh, are, are really a takes a lot of skill to do those well. You come along with the town trust, he basically took, and also their larger members. So town comes along and says, I'm going to take some relatively smaller members. Typically, they're three by 11, three by 10s, uh, relatively easy to get. No real joints. You drill a hole and drive a trunnel. And that was really what it was. And it's it's a simple design, but it it's it's pretty powerful. You can have multiple spans really without changing the design. Uh, you mentioned railroad bridges. Uh, this truss with some modifications, this type can handle railroad loads as well. So really what it was is it it took away some of that need for the really high, highly skilled uh, joint, joint work. Well, and I guess that answers my second question, which is why would a bridge right choose a town truss over another design? And it, it sounds like it just seems much easier to build. Yeah, I think I think that's a lot of it. There's There's a trade-off with them. They do use more wood per foot than other truss designs, so it's not as an efficient design, you know, from an engineering standpoint. Uh, but if you balance it out with the cost of labor, um, that would be a reason to, you know, to go with the town trust. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about Ithiel Town? Yeah, I'm not not an expert on him, but from you know what I've read, uh, he's you know born in 1784, Thompson, Connecticut, and actually educated as an architect, not an engineer. Continued through, uh, you know, his designs, did his first covered bridge in 1818. And then did, I think we'll talk a little later, but, you know, did a first patent in 1820. And outside of covered bridges, had some some pretty good designs, famous designs. Uh, he designed the Connecticut State Capitol, North Carolina State House. So in and amongst doing the, uh, the covered bridges, he was doing, you know, a lot of good, you know, building design works and larger ones. And then ended up with a second patent in 1835 and uh, died like nine years later and is buried in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. He repatented his design in 1835. What What's the difference between that 1835 patent and the 1820 patent? Yeah, the major difference is in the number of cords. So in the original patent, uh, if you if you think about that lattice you were talking about, those are the diagonal pieces. And then there's two cords. There's a top and a bottom. And those are the horizontal members you would see in the bridge. In the original patent, he just showed uh, a, a single upper cord and a single lower cord. And that was fine for smaller bridges. But what would happen in a longer bridge, um, you picture something in compression that kind of gets a little wavy. The bridges would get wavy. So what he did in 1835 was added a second top and bottom cord, which really stiffened up the truss. Um, some people were doing it before that, but that was that was the major change going to the the later patent. What do you think that was because of the use of the rail, railroad bridges? Because that was about the same time that the railroad. I mean, I'm just guessing, but because they really yeah, I'm sure that was part of it. Their loads for a while. Yeah, that was that was certainly part of it. I think, and I know in. Uh, New York and the, the Beaver Kill covered bridge we worked on, that was a longer town trap town lattice with a single upper and lateral uh, upper and lower cord. And you you could see it in the it was kind of interesting over time the top cord wasn't straight and it kind of bowed along the way. And as they rebuilt it over stages, they would it, it was kind of a challenge to rehabilitate it because you picture if it's straight and all the rafters sit on the top cord, it's pretty easy to replace them. But now as they replace things over time, some rafters were longer than the other because it was wavy. So it, it really created some challenges. And I think that that waviness to them, and it would reduce how much load they could they could carry as well. How many town lattice trust covered bridges are there? So the last numbers I had, and they might be a little out of date, was 143 in the U.S. 
with actually Vermont leading. Vermont has a lot of Vermont approximately has a hundred covered bridges. Forty two of those are covered are town lattice. Oh wow. And then there's a lot in Quebec and Canada as well. They've lost them recently, but the last number I had was 81. And that's a little bit of a different variant from uh, the, the traditional, you know, you know, U.S. town lattice. Okay. Well, and that's my next question. So if a bridge is classified as a town truss, and I know we like to classify covered bridges with a specific truss, and sometimes that's easier to do than other times. Um, does that mean that they're all the same? No, there's that. There's actually quite a uh, quite a lot of variation in them, and uh, you know, I'll give credit to Joseph Conwell from National Society of Preservation of Covered Bridges. He did a lot of work in the past on documenting this. But the the basics of a town truss is that crisscross lattice in the cords. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much standard. But what what then starts to happen is some of them have double or you know, two upper and lower cords. Sometimes the angle of the lattice, typically they're 45 degrees, but sometimes they're 50, 55, weird, different angles. Uh, I don't know why, but builders would do that based on the site. Okay. I had mentioned beaver kill. Um, there's a couple in New York that have this neat detail at the end where they're kind of, if you picture the N3, they added an extra piece in it. It's kind of splayed like a fan. So if you're looking at the end lattice, it's kind of like this, they added more because that's where the load goes. Um, but that was something unique to them. Okay. In in New Hampshire, the uh, Cornish Lind Windsor you, is technically a town lattice, but the lattice are square. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not planks. And, um, and I mentioned the Quebec ones before. What's kind of interesting with those, you know, we talked about the Trunnels. Those don't typically have trunnels where the lattice pass by each other. They only have them where they go through the cords. Oh, okay. And again, I'm not I'm not the historian on that. I'm not sure why. I don't, it's probably a money saving thing, I would guess, but I, I don't know. So let's talk about the Haverhill Bath Bridge, which was built in 1829, um, and it's the oldest remaining town lattice truss bridge in the world, I believe. Yes, that's yep, that's correct. Okay. So, and in 2008, mm -hmm. you uh, led a $1.3 million re rehabilitation project on that bridge. And during that project, the goal, of course, was to res restore the bridge in a historically accurate manner. Can you talk a little bit about that process and what those standards are? Yeah, at the time we were following, it's, it's, it's a long name, but the Secretary of the Interior's Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. And that was basically the, the guide we had at the time. And since, since then, 2019, there's now a uh, guidelines for rehabilitating historic covered bridges. The, the approach, the details are different, but the, the approach is generally the same. So the idea is when you're looking at a truss, you, you evaluate what's original material. And that's what you really want to you know, try to uh, retain as much as possible. So first goal is retain what's there. If you need to then do some work, you first try to repair it, save as much of the material as you can. If you can't repair it, then you look at maybe splicing, adding something on. Mm -hmm. If you can't sp splice it or repair, you go to the, then a full replacement. So it's kind of this hierarchy. If you get to replacement, the idea is replace it with something that's of similar um, size and species. And then the last option would be to, you know, supplement or add, you know, maybe go with like a glue land, which wouldn't have been traditional. Right. So you yeah. kind of fall through this hierarchy of repairs on it. Okay. Is it difficult to, with a bridge that, that old, I mean, it's almost 200 years old. Is it difficult to, to figure out if the timber is the original timber or is that easy for you to do? It depends. Um, by and large, what we found is a majority of the trusses and the upper framing, the the bracing, the rafters, a lot of that tends to be original to the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, the floor system is usually fairly sacrificial, even the floor beams. Right. And it's 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 easier to tell if it's new than it's old. So what I mean by that is if it's pressure treated lumber, then it's new. Right. If it's a we can test for species. So if it's a Douglas fir, southern pine, something from outside New England then you know it's new okay. if you test it and it's you know a local spruce um 
it's, you know, then it does get to be harder to tell. Can you talk a little bit about the floor framing of that bridge? Yeah, that was, that was interesting in that the, the town patent shows uh, for the floor system, there's floor beams that basically span between the trusses. And then you nail on top of that a longitudinal deck. So that's typically what's shown. In Haverhill Bath, what you have is transverse floor beams. Then there's longitudinal stringers on top of that, and then a transverse deck. So kind of unusual. So a couple things came up with that. One is we found some information, and others did as well. Not just you know our our company, but um, there's one thing I didn't mention with Town's patent was he it, he patented it, and then he had patent not attorneys, but enforcers, I guess. Mm -hmm. they, would, they would go, or salesmen, they'd go around to sell it. And it was mm -hmm. usually a dollar per foot. And if you used his patent without paying him, then he charged you $2 a foot. Yeah. <laughs> so there was some discussion in uh, in Haverhill and some, some records. There, were, there wasn't really clear, but there, it seemed like they were trying to get away with maybe not paying town on the patent. Oh, interesting. And I don't know if that was what came up with the floor system. The other part of it, back to your earlier question, was the age of it. So uh, we were really fortunate to have Jim Garvin, who was with the New Hampshire Division of Historic Resources at the time. Um, he was help. He was reviewing the project and looked went went out in the field and looked at the beams. And again, you were asking about how to tell if the, the age, um, the older the older fabrication of the wood was kind of on a sawmill and it was usually an up and down saw. So you could see those marks in the wood. Okay. Newer ones that circular saw and you can see those marks as well. So these, these were up or down, up and down saw marks. So we knew it was most likely, you know, early 1800s uh, or mid to early 1800s. So, and, and just the way they were framed in and everything, it, it appeared that as hard as it was to believe initially, but, uh, those floor beams might have been original to 1829 in the bridge. Wow. We know that a town trust, you know, you can have a double town or, or you can use it for longer spans, but can you explain why in that Haverhill Bath Bridge, four 16 plank lam laminated arches were added in 1921 and 22? Yeah, that was brought about by um, John Storrs, who was a, a famous Concord, New Hampshire engineer and, had stores and stores, had his own consulting engineering firm. And there was some laws around that time that required certain loadings for different bridges. So he went out and did a lot of evaluations on bridges and said, your bridge is good for, you know, whatever load. In in this case, he initially, um, I don't want to say the number, it was pretty low. He came up with a pretty low number for that. And they kind of just left it. And then he came back four or five years later and the it was actually the water company there wanted to add a sidewalk on downstream so it's outboard of the trusses mm -hmm. and so in 1921 he recommended that and provided some design so that's the way what the the arches are basically for uh there's the, the arches come down to some needle beams that go transverse to the bridge and then basically pick up help pick up the weight of that uh sidewalk it's it's an interesting thing in, in to consider when you when you go back to the Secretary of the Interior Standards. If you go back to 1829, there was no sidewalk. Mm -hmm. If you go back to 1920s, there was. So what do you rehabilitate to? And we had a lot of uh, spirited discussions on that. And one option was to take out the arches and get rid of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And again, Jim Garvin was integral to all that and... Um, Eventually, the town decided they wanted to keep keep that, but it does create some problems on that bridge in that the the sidewalk is outside the trusses, and then it kind of wants to bend the you know tip the bridge in one direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you can see that still the bridge definitely seems to tilt a little bit. It does. We uh, we had, and I haven't mentioned contractors, but there's some really good contractors. Um, right Constructions, one we work a, a lot with out of Vermont. Uh, certainly the Greatons, Arnold and Stan. Um, you know, we've we've worked with all of them. There's there's others as well. I don't want to leave anyone out, but just the ones we've worked with on these projects. And Wright worked on that project. And it's hard. You're, 
they were trying to pull it back straight, realign everything. And it's kind of limited. It's a, it's a fairly stiff trust, which is a good thing. But if you're not replacing a lot of it, it's hard for hard to get it to, you know, it's been like that for almost 200 years. Right. So you're, you're in a matter of a month or two trying to pull it back. So we, we right. did improve it quite a bit, but it's still, um, it's still not, you know, it's still not perfect. No. Well, that's okay. I mean, there are homes like that too. You know, if you have a 200 year old house, your house sometimes is not particularly straight and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is fine. Um, so the, the project was awarded a New Hampshire Preservation Alliance Award, um, which is which is fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about those awards? Sure. Uh, New Hampshire Preservation Alliance is a is a is a really good group. Uh, a lot of different people come together and put a lot of time into that organization. And they're probably best known for the seven to save list they come out with. So every year they pick or they, they have nominations for you know, seven historic structures that are kind of in, in danger of uh, being replaced. They also have the annual awards. And, you know, it's, I was, I, I looked it up before we talked, but it's, uh, they said the awards are for preservation of rare and iconic properties, steward, stewardship of community assets and gathering places. So, and then also individuals, with significant impact in education, planning, and advocacy will also be recognized. So mm-hmm. related to Covered Bridge, uh, Bridges Haverhill Bath, uh, the Blair Bridge in Campton, and just this year, the Beamett Bridge in Bradford, we've mm-hmm. I've all received those awards. And on the planning and advocacy side, I thought a really special thing they did was they recognized Arnold Brayton, yeah. um, who's just tremendous. He We worked with him on the Blair Bridge and I think at the time Arnold was, I would just say, I'll be nice. He was in his mid seventies and he was out with the crew swinging sledgehammers and doing things the guys 40s, 40 years younger than him wouldn't mm-hmm. do. You know? mm-hmm. So, so really good organization. So in switching gears a little bit. So in 1998, you were the project engineer for the rehabilitation of the Eshwilat bridge in Winchester, which was at the time, $667,000. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I mentioned starting at Hoyle Tanner. That was one of the first two I worked on. Um, it's, it's funny too. Yeah, so 1998, and the cost, the cost now would probably be oh, yeah. two million dollars. Oh yeah. Um, but the the project was basically, you know, again that stewardish stewardship thing, um, replacement of the floor system. Uh, there was a water line on the sidewalk. That's a really it's a really pretty bridge. It's painted white, has twin sidewalks, some nice architectural features to it. But it had this water line on the sidewalk. So we put that under the river, fixed the floor system, and then there were roof re- you know, repairs to the truss and uh, roof system. And what's what's interesting about the floor system is I think there were like 88 floor beams. So these are the transverse members that support the decking. Mm -hmm. And we went through, and I think 29 of them were broken. Wow. And, and what, what happens is you, you know, you post these bridges, maybe it says three tons, six tons, and a a heavy vehicle can go over it. But what people don't realize is that causes damage. Mm -hmm. And what we found later was there was a, a company on the other side that was doing logging and they were bringing firewood across the bridge. Oh no. And they kept going and event, you know, eventually, you know, started to break floor beams and create more problems. But, um, yeah, so that was, that was a really good problem. That was, uh, Tim Andrews, Barnes and Bridges of New Ham- of New England, uh, was the, the bridge right on that one. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I talked about Trunnels and I, I mentioned this in the chapter on this bridge because, um, it's, it seemed like that was a very big part of that project was to, pull the tunnels out and to make the new ones. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the the key to that, there's there's a couple of keys to it is if, if you think about two pieces of wood connected by these tunnels, they're under a lot of pressure. So the first thing you have to do is shore up the bridge and relieve the pressure so you can drive them back out. Mm-hmm. And then you have to, whether it's a new member or old, you, you kind of have to fine tune the size of the, the tunnel, the diameter uh, to fit. And everybody does it a little bit different, and there's some different things. Tim on that one had this, there's no other way to call it. It was like this pencil sharpener. 
he, he had this old machine he had found. He got bought these dies, and it was kind of like he just went across, and he could kind of dial in what he needed. Um, and, and that's the key to it. Really, got to unload the structure, and then and then get the right size trunnels back. Wow. I have one of those trunnels in my kitchen. Oh, do you? From that bridge, yeah. Oh, excellent. I do. Yeah. I have that, which is small comparatively. And then I have one from the, the New England College bridge that Arnold gave me, which is huge. Um, so, yeah, yeah, quite a bit different. And yeah, I have a few here. They're, yeah, they're really, really cool. And the other neat thing about the Trunnels, and um, it, again, depends on how much time the contractor wants to take with it, some of those will get quite a bit of bend to them. Mm hmm. So they, they're under a lot of stress and they'll actually bend a bit, you know, and uh, which is hard to believe when you're holding in your hands, but um, they'll, they'll bend quite a bit before they break. That completed project received the first ever Palladio Award for Covered Bridges in 2003. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that was an interesting one. Um, I don't have a lot of details. That was pretty early in my career, but it was, uh, they're still giving those awards. It's a traditional building conference and it's really a building building award and I, I wish i had more details um you know some of the people that were involved aren't around with us anymore but uh yeah it's a, it's a national award we had a, a presentation for it and uh, uh john gamarlo was i think pretty instrumental in that john worked with the yeah. town of winchester for a number of years and mm -hmm. was really a, an advocate for the you know covered bridges in town also in the same area. So in 1999 in nearby Swansea, um, Hoyle Tanner and Associates was hired by the town to rebuild the Slate Bridge, which had been destroyed by arson um, in 1993. And how was it decided to build another town trust? Yeah, that's a really great story. They they had the town had a real dedicated group of volunteers, and they the bridge burned down. They put in a temporary steel bridge. Uh, the abutments were in really good shape. And they wanted a covered bridge back. So they, they raised quite a bit of money. They have annual uh, bike races. They did a lot of you know bake sales, all those T-shirts, the whole thing, and, and raised the fund for the bridge. Now, when they got kind of the seed money together, the state kicked in the other 80%. So that was through state, state bridge aid, which is a great program. Mm -hmm. That paid 80%, the town, the other 20. And I think the other key to that, the location is... It's a fairly low volume road. Mm -hmm. It's it parallels Route 10 in that area, and um, it's so that's a good place to have that kind of bridge. It's not getting super heavy loads, and it's it's posted for 15 tons. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, really, it's just the the people that were involved in you know raising the money. That's great, and that's to me that's the spirit of a lot of those smaller communities because Swansea has four covered bridges. And Swansea is not a very big place, so it would have been a lot more cost effective in some ways for them to just say, forget it. But they wanted their covered bridge back and they got it. Yeah, yeah and they've, they've been really they've been really proactive um, with a lot in that town. They've done uh, on, on the other bridges. We've worked a little on some of these, but we've installed fire protection on all the bridges in town. Uh, so they want to keep them around, particularly after one was burned down. Mm -hmm. Also some scour protection, so against river forces, they've done projects on that, and then then the rehabilitations as well. Um, so it's it's a key it's a key, and if you go to their the town website, that's something they you know they boast. It's a you know a, um, helps drive business to the area too, mm -hmm. and tourism. People are very proud. They're very proud to have their covered bridges, and and uh, it's because of those people I think that a lot of them stay. Yeah, absolutely. So another award uh, was given for your work um, at the Slate Bridge. It won the 2002 National Timber Bridge Award, the 2003 National Council of Structural Engineers Associations Award, and the Plan New Hampshire Award in 2004. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you. We uh, those are those are good. You know, those are interesting in that there's there's a national award, a couple of national awards, one structural, and then there's a local planning award so kind of a, a wide range and really those i think what we like about so as i mentioned we do a lot of different bridges and often you you do the bridge and it opens and nobody knows oh the bridge is open good you know that was inconvenient 
Covered bridges are different. There's a usually a grand opening. It's a big deal. We have ribbon cuttings. And I think those awards really celebrate, you know, the people that are behind these projects. There's a lot of people who put a lot of time in that nobody ever knows about. Um, and it also shows they could be a viable part of the, the transportation infrastructure. Right. <clears throat> well, I can tell you, uh, downtown Peterborough is in my traffic route, and I was pretty happy when that bridge reopened. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, we have a couple projects in there. That one's wrapping up now, uh, paving, and then 101 is still going to be going on for a little bit. But, yeah, well, um, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so um, in 2002, you designed the engineering plans alongside Bob Durfee for the Sillyville Bog Bridge in, in Andover, and that was a $150,000 project, which doesn't sound expensive now nowadays, but can can you talk about that? Yeah, that was a, that was another one. Um, the, the town administrator, really, Mark Stetson at the time, um, kind of drove that, got some funding for it. Uh, Tim Andrews was the, the the bridge right on it, and really, I, I don't want to downplay it, but a pretty basic project was to, uh, you know, redo some of the, the a new roof was the big thing, um, roof and decking, some siding, rehabilitation of the trusses. Um, so that's right off the side of the road, Route 11, and it's it's a nice nice little area and, and preserved real well. Mm -hmm. It is, and that also received a New Hampshire Preservation Alliance Award as well. Yes, yes, it did. Thank you. Yeah. So, all right. So this is like the big covered bridge con conspiracy theory. So it was built in <laughs> that bit, bridge was built in 1887 by Prentice Charles Atwood and has always had a tilt to it. And so the rumor is that his assistants, Charles Sleeper and Alan Emerson cut shortcut some timbers as a passive aggressive way to way to get back at him. Do do you think that that's true? I don't know. I wish I had I, I hadn't heard about that till you mentioned it and I, I wish I'd known we were out there. We would have done some more detailed measurements of it. Um but it it really wouldn't surprise me. Covered bridge bridge rights contractors are uh I, I think one thing they all have in common is they have really strong personalities and <laughs> in, in a good way. Uh, and the people that work for them do too. So it, yeah. it, it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case, but I don't know for sure. That's funny. Well, I, I think it's, I think it's a great story. Um, and you know what I found in the research that I've did too, there are a lot of really great stories, but I can't, I can't prove any of them. So Right, right. I don't know, but it's a good one, so we'll leave it in there. Um, and so the nearby Keniston Bridge, which is next to the Sillyville Bog Bridge, um, is also a town trust. And, and the last time I think I spoke to you, there were some plans for work on that bridge? Yeah, we're actually uh, working on those now. It's, it's not a full rehabilitation. That one's kind of interesting. It's on a dead-end road. There's a lot of... Um, like a sand pit and some logging on the other side. So what the, the town and the state did a number of years ago was put some steel beams under it. Mm -hmm. So that carries most of the load. Some of the members connecting to that have some, some rod in them that we're taking care of. Um, so it's really just, you know, needed structural repairs at this point. It, it, it does need a, uh, a full rehabilitation. I think the town will like to do that. Um, just, just a matter of funding and timing. Right. right. Um, do you have a favorite town trust? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know if I have a single favorite. I, I slate for me kind of stands out in that it was, it was the first one I, I did the full design of the bridge. Uh, it's a new design. There's not a lot of those, mm -hmm. you know, we meant, you know, you mentioned the 40 something projects of those only three of them are new. So by and large, it's rehabilitations or strengthenings of those sorts of things. But Slate was a new design. Um, so I, good memories of that, the people we worked with. And Ishwilet as well. That's a really, that's just the first one I worked on, one of the first. And it's a really pretty bridge. Mm -hmm. It is. So <clears throat> what takeaway should our listeners have about a town trust? Like what makes a town trust special? I think to me, it's 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 the simplicity of it you know, from a construction standpoint, um, the bridge does use more wood than other bridges, but it's, it's offset by the labor savings. You don't need, 
you know, a lot of highly skilled craftsmen to, you know, do these intricate joints. It also has a lot of redundancy, which I think is important for um, some covered bridge owners are really good about maintaining their bridges. Others are not. And if you're not and they start to get wet and rot, um, you know, towns are really good, solid bridges. We, there's been a couple that we, we did save, but the top cord had completely buckled. It just, mm. it was out of, out of plane by like a couple of feet. Mm. And you're like, how is this thing still standing? Well, there's so much redundancy built in all those crisscross members that the loads can go around those sorts of things. So, um, wow. So I, I think that's what it is, just the simplicity of it. And it's, it's got a neat story. You know, it has a patent to it. Not a lot of them do. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, quite, you know, I think of, we went back to those numbers in the beginning. I think in the country, they're probably about, I don't know the exact number, but 15% of the covered bridges are town lattice. So it's a popular mm -hmm. design as well. Yep, it is. It definitely is. Well, thank you so much for talking with, with us today about the the town trust. This was, this was great. I, I learned when I started this project, I didn't know what a trust was. Um, so <laughs> I, I have, I have learned a lot and, and I hope that people listening have also learned a lot as well. So thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been great. Thank you. Covered Bridges of New Hampshire is created by me and recorded in Hancock, New Hampshire. The song Old New Hampshire was arranged and performed by Josh Black. The introduction is courtesy of Greg Kretschmar. This podcast is a companion to my book, Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. You can find out more about the book, the podcast, blog posts, upcoming events, and an interactive covered bridge map at coveredbridgesnh.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. Please rate, review, and subscribe to or follow the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kim Chandler. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.